It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews are just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? And Jesus answered, are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Only so far may the Lord bless the reading of his word. As we open up this passage, we see clearly the relationship between this passage and the portion of Scripture that went before when Jesus and his disciples in chapter 9 of John encountered a blind man. And Jesus' words to them was that this man was born blind. It's neither that he sinned nor his parents sinned, chapter 9 and verse 3, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. And so... The glory of God is put on display through the healing of the blind man. We even see that the leaders of the synagogue acknowledge that this is a work of God. Verse 24, they said, for the second time they called to the man and had been blind and they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. And so now in chapter 11, we have another opportunity The disciples have another opportunity to see the glory of God on display through the work of the Son of Man. So the setup is much the same as in chapter 9. Jesus is going to show the glory of God, or God is going to show His glory through His Son. You'll know, and because you know the story, you'll see in verse 40, a portion we'll look at next Sunday, Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God? And then Jesus lifted up his eyes and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. The glory of God is put on display for the disciples in order for them to believe. And this is another theme that carries through. Jesus says in verse 15, For your sake, I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. So here is the purpose for everything happening in this chapter then. The first purpose is, it is for the glory of God, and secondly, it is so that the disciples may believe. So here is the purpose for everything that is taking place in this chapter. It is for the glory of God, and secondly, it's so that the disciples may believe. So what is happening We read that a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Now, if you read anything in the Synoptic Gospels, you would know about Mary and Martha. You would know that the two sisters, Jesus was at their house, and one of the sisters was busy working, and the other sister was sitting at the feet of Jesus, and the one who was doing all the work complained, Jesus, tell my sister to help me with the preparations and with the food. But then Jesus commended Mary, the sister who was sitting at Jesus' feet because she chose the more important portion. And so it's well, we'll do well to keep that in mind. I'll 
open it up for us more next week to look at the differences between these two sisters in how they uh, approached the Lord when he was in their home, and then also how they approached the crisis of the death of their brother. And so it was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment, verse 2, and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. And so we have more information with regards to Mary. John is alerting, alluding to the fact that later on in his gospel, he will point to Mary who anointed the Lord just before his death. So we'll come to that in John chapter 12 and see how Mary anoints the Lord's uh, feet with ointment and wiping his feet with her hair. But immediately in the setup of this passage, we are told that Lazarus is ill. And we might think, who is this Lazarus? Why is he so important? But the passage shows us that Jesus was intimately known to Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. Jesus had intimate fellowship with these people, and in fact, he loved them. The sisters sent to him, verse 3, just notice the intimacy of this message, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. He whom you love is ill. This is a hint to the intimacy between Jesus and this family. No name attached. He knows that it, the message is from Mary and Martha. And to hear then, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Now, let me illustrate something for you to, to show you Jesus' actions seem out of the ordinary, but maybe not all that out of the ordinary. So here you receive a message that a friend of yours or a family member is severely ill. I remember doing this in a young adult's Bible class once, and Jed was sitting right there, and I asked him, Jed, if your friend is ill, what do you, what do you, he said, I'm going to rush to my friend. I want to get to my friend as soon as possible. If you hear of a loved one who is ill, our natural instinct is to immediately rush to that person. Now, what do we see Jesus doing? Jesus isn't rushing in. He whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Does this seem like the actions of someone who loves the sick? I mean, naturally, we would say if you love someone who was sick, you would rush. You would do anything to get there. But now Jesus is staying. But even more strange than Jesus not going up and leaving for the bedside of Lazarus is the fact that his disciples don't find his behavior strange at all. How would you react if you were to see someone hearing news of a loved one who is ill and they don't want to rush off but stay two days longer? So all of a sudden you know there's more going on than we might realize. And the clue is right there in the text. Verse 8. After the two days that they stayed, verse 7, Jesus said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. And the disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews are just now seeking to stone you. And are you going there again? So you see the place where Lazarus was, where Mary and Martha were staying, was in a dangerous territory. It was a place where Jesus is unwanted. We know because in the previous chapter, we saw how the Jews were picking up stones to stone him. And Jesus said to them, for what work, for what good work are you stoning me? For what, for what good work do you seek to put me to death? And so the disciples remind Jesus when he now wants to go to Lazarus that Jesus, did you forget they just, they want to kill you? All of a sudden it makes sense to us why Jesus is not rushing to the sickbed of Lazarus. Because it might mean that Jesus will be confronted with those who hate him and want to kill him. 
And his disciples are aware of the pressure on their Lord, but also now on them. You see? In the beginning, when we looked at the Gospel of John, when Jesus was overturning the tables, when Jesus is confronting and fighting, we cheer. We say, yes, he's fighting with the religious leaders. Great. But just like the disciples in this passage, it all of a sudden dawns upon us. Oh boy. Oh boy. Siding with Jesus means that we're declaring open enmity with those who are at odds with Jesus. We open ourselves for the same for the same sort of conflict. We open ourselves up to the same battle. When we cheer Jesus on, when we're happy that Jesus fights the religious leaders, it opens us up for the wrath that comes from this world. And so the disciples in this text feel it very keenly. Jesus stayed for two days longer, and then after this, he said to his disciples, verse 7, let us go to Judea again. Let us go. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews are just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? You can almost sense the urgency in their question. You can't seriously be contemplating going to that place now. And then Jesus responds in verse 9, and he answered them. He said, are there not 12 hours in the day? So Jesus is not answering their question outright, but he's answering with a saying, with a proverb that they would be familiar with. The proverb and the saying that they're familiar with is this one. Are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. And so by this question or saying, what Jesus is in effect telling them is, while it is day, you do the work of the day, and while it is night, you don't do, you don't do that work in the nighttime. You do what is required of you when it's required of you. And so Jesus is saying, I'm not going to shy away from this challenge. I have to go and see Lazarus. Jesus tells them as much in verse 11. After saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. I have a work to do. I go to awaken Lazarus. I have important work to do. Here Jesus is setting his disciples an example and he's teaching them that obedience to the Lord, obedience to the Lord, when it's required of us, we must perform it regardless of the opposition we face. Because what are the disciples expecting? What are they expecting to happen when they go to Judea with Jesus? Look at what Thomas said in verse 16. Let us go that we also may die with him. Let us follow Jesus that we also may die with, die with him. Thomas has no positive outlook on what Jesus has just, just said. Jesus was saying, I go to awaken Lazarus. This illness is to the glory of God. And the things that are going to take place is so that you may believe. But we also see then our Lord's patience with his disciples, right? Because in verse 15, Jesus says to them, for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. You see, what is going to happen there is going to awaken faith in them. What is going to happen at the grave of Lazarus is going to work out for them to believe. And so what do we expect to find? You see, oftentimes when the Lord wants to teach us something about faith, something about belief, our immediate initial responses, but I do believe. I do believe. Aren't we your disciples? Don't we believe? But I think the words in verse 16 show us, as Thomas said, let us go with him that we may die with him. Those aren't words of faith. 
coming from the mouth of a disciple of Jesus? This is, these are words of unbelief and doubt. Even as Thomas showed his own doubt and unbelief until the end of the gospel. Won't believe unless I put my finger on his wounds. We see the sort of patience that Jesus has with disciples like Thomas who continually doubts, who proceeds from a place of unbelief. We need to have patience with people who are showing their unbelief. There are disciples of Jesus who show unbelief. We need to be patient with them because the Lord is teaching them faith, you see. The Lord is teaching us faith. Say what you will about Thomas, about his doubting and unbelief, at least Thomas went with Jesus. He's a disciple who didn't expect anything good to come of it. Doubt and unbelief, right? But he still went. But he still went. He still went. So we see then this tension. The disciples are afraid because there is animosity. Verse 8, Rabbi, the Jews are just now seeking to stone you. Are you going there again? And so when Jesus tells them, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. Jesus is saying, I know my purpose. I know what I'm going to do and I must perform it. I must do what I have been sent to do. I'm not going to shrink back because there are threats against my life. I'm not going to shrink back because of the threats against me. We've learned something of this in our men's Bible study through Philippians, right? In Philippians, Paul tells the Philippian Christians that it has been granted to you not only to believe in Christ, but to suffer for his sake. And he's writing to a church while he is in prison awaiting, awaiting his trial and judgment. And the reason why Paul is in prison is for the word of God. And the temptation might be for Paul to deny the word of God, to shrink back from these things because he might be put to death for preaching the gospel of Christ. But yet Paul stands firm in the gospel and he encourages the churches to stand firm in the word of God and in the gospel of Christ. As Jesus is encouraging his disciples here to the same thing. Are there not 12 hours in the day? Disciples, shouldn't you be walking with Jesus while he is with you? Shouldn't you be walking with Jesus? But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. You see, if Jesus was constantly worried about the plotting Jews, they would be setting the tone for his ministry. What Jesus is demonstrating to us, in other words, that his animosity and his conflict with the religious leaders is not a conflict which they have the authority in. They don't have the upper hand. You see, how do we live as Christians? Do we live as if the devil, as if our enemies have the upper hand and might vanquish us at any moment? You see, the disciples fell for that sort of temptation. They're seeking to stone you. Don't go. Are you really going there? Are you really going to do that? Don't you know that here is a reason why you shouldn't be? Holding up the threats of the enemy. You see, Jesus is then demonstrating and teaching his disciples also that the threats of the enemy cannot stop the ministry and the work of the Son of God. How many times have we read that Jesus eluded arrest or escaped because it was not yet the hour? It was not yet the time. And when Jesus hung on that cross and darkness fell, 
Isn't this what Jesus is alluding to when he says, walk while it, while it is day, while the 12 hours of day is at hand? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Jesus is preparing his disciples and teaching them so that when the time comes, when he ascends into heaven and when they will be sent out into this world, that they may show that they are true disciples of Christ in the way that they minister, in the way that they preach the gospel. You see, Jesus didn't just select 12 men, gave them a bunch of books to read, and then told them, preach what you read. Jesus discipled them for three years. He lived in their midst. They ate together. They walked together. They accompanied Jesus on his mission, on his, in his ministry. And everything that Jesus did in his ministry was to encourage their faith, to train them, to teach them, but to do this through showing and leading them on. Isn't this the same way that Jesus leads us? You see, when, when the word of God comes to us and when Jesus requires something of us, when God requires obedience of us, we must see that the obedience required of us is nothing different than Christ himself was also willing to do. You're not required to do anything that is superhuman. You're not required to do more than is required of you. I teach a homeschool class on a Friday, and they're busy with a Shakespeare play called Macbeth. I can't remember the exact quote, but one of the, one of the words, if I may paraphrase, one of the sayings is, a man must only do what is required of him but when a man does more than what is required of him, that's when things fall apart. And we had a discussion with the teenagers there because if you look at the temptation in the garden, Adam did not do what was required of him. He wanted more, wanted to be God. He wanted to be more than a man, to transcend his humanness. But you see, God doesn't require of us to transcend your humanness. He created you to be man, woman. He created you. He placed you in the speci specific place where you are now. He placed the disciples here in this specific place to teach them a specific lesson. Though they may not like it and though we may not like the pressures that are coming our way because of where we are at this time? Are we going to moan and complain because of our circumstances? Or are we going to look? Are we going to look at Jesus? Because you see, Jesus saying to them in verse 4, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. What Jesus is saying is don't focus your attention on the illness. Don't focus your attention on the death. But focus your attention on the glory of God. So that the Son of Man may be glorified through it. This illness, this death is to display the glory of the Son of God. You see? Can you, in your circumstances, whatever they may be, focus on the glory of the Son of God and see how your circumstances show the glory of Christ? Or is a way for God to reveal the glory of His Son in your life as a disciple of Jesus? Isn't Jesus just gently encouraging you, look at me, Look at the Lord, look at the Son of God, 
and see what He is going to do. Right? What's, the, what's the natural reaction of us when we feel that there's a crisis in our life? What am I going to do? What are we going to do? But you see, the disciples here, when Jesus said, let us go, let us go. Rabbi, the Jews are seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? This is not, this is not for us. We don't think that it's the, right, it's the right course of action. But yet, when Jesus tells them, are there not 12 hours in the day? After saying these things to them, our friend, friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. Jesus discloses his purpose. I go to awaken Lazarus. And then the disciples said to him, so again they try to persuade him not to go, begging him almost, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover. Right? If, it's, if a sick person is resting well, they'll get better. You don't need to go. You don't need to rush off. Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. And the disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. But then John speaks plainly. Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. And then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. Lazarus has died, and for your sake, I am glad that I was not there. I'm glad for your sake that I was not there. You see, in our circumstances, we sometimes ask, where is God in all of this? And sometimes Jesus feels far away. He's not there. Also for our sake, so that we may believe, so that when he comes and we look at him and see his work that he does, You see, so instead of wanting to rush in and control our circumstances, what must I do? What shall I do? What am I going to do? To wait upon the Lord. To wait upon Jesus. Because the glory of God is going to be revealed through our circumstances so that the Son of God may be glorified through it through it and i know that the circumstances described in john are unique circumstances but it's circumstances relating death life and death and so i think it carries through to our circumstances relating to life and death are these circumstances in your life related to life and death right if they're not they're not that weighty but if they are matters of life and death, then that's exactly the place where we need to look for the Son of God and the glory of the Son of God. You see, for too many Christians, we think that Jesus is only involved in the airy-fairy, nitty-gritty little things of life. But when it comes to true matters of death and sickness and illness, then no, Jesus is not there. His word has no application because this is the work of the devil or things like that. It's not the case. It's not the case. It's precisely in these circumstances because what Jesus is showing us here in John's gospel, in particular in this chapter 11, you'll also notice that chapter 11 is almost nicely in the middle of this gospel and what we're going to witness here is the resurrection from the dead of Lazarus by Jesus calling him out of the grave. And what is the great sign of the book of John, of the gospel of John at the end? It's going to be the resurrection of Christ himself. And there are important parallels between these two passages. But there are also important, very important differences between them. which we'll look at later. But you see, what Jesus wants to teach his disciples here is that for your sake, 
I'm glad that I was not there. So what we see here is something of the Lord's sovereignty in determining where he will be. You see, even in his humanness. It's no accident he was, in, he was not in Bethany when Lazarus died. It's no accident that he can't go to his friend because of the threats of the Jewish religious leaders. It's no accident that these things took place in the order that they did. But everything takes place in the exact way God intended it to put his own glory on display. It's not only in the passage that we read, but also in our life, you see. Do you believe that God has so ordered your life that every aspect of your life, even the difficulties, even the trials, are so organized in order to show forth the glory of His Son? Or do things just randomly happen to you? You see, Paul says to the Roman Christians, God works all things together for the good of those who love Him. God works together all all things to the good of those who love him. How can this death of Lazarus be to the good of those who love him? But you see, Jesus is teaching us that he is the resurrection and the life, as he will show Martha and Mary through the rest of this passage. But I want us to be ready, to be primed for next Sunday. Come Next Sunday, in order to and expect this, just as the disciples were told to expect as they go to Bethany. I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him now. When we move into this passage of going to Bethany with the disciples, let us be primed and ready so that we may believe. Let's close with verse 16. Let's see. Thomas then saying, the one called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, so as we call to go and believe, let's also see that this is no call to easy believism. This is no call to just easy, oh, just believe in Jesus. But to feel the challenge of that call to faith. To feel the challenge of that call to faith because the call to faith is a call to come out of your comfort zone. Get out of the place of comfort. It's definitely out of the comfort here for the disciples. Let us go that we may die with him. It's going to be so uncomfortable we're going to die. I just also want us to know then, let's close with Hebrews the end of chapter 11 and the beginning of chapter 12. Let's see this truth that the call to faith calls us outside of our comfort zone. We're not called to pleasant pleasantries, sit back in an easy chair. Look at verse 35 of chapter 11 in Hebrews. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy wandering about in deserts and mountains and in the dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Since God has provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus. You see, as I've already said from John 11, looking unto the Son of God who will be glorified through these circumstances, looking unto Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, 
This tells us that the faith that we have does not come from us. Jesus is the author and the perfecter of that faith. He's the one who went before us, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. For the joy that was set before him endured the cross. The joy comes after the cross. The joy comes after the suffering. The relief comes after the suffering. Despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. So when you think that sinners are against you, the world is against you, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Didn't Jesus teach this to his disciples? If they hated me, they'll hate you. If they hate you, just remember with which hatred they hated him. Because you are being persecuted or killed for his namesake. If it's really for his namesake. Peter also helps us to evaluate this. Are you suffering because you're doing righteousness or are you suffering because you did evil? If you're suffering because you did evil, that's just righteous repayment. But if you're suffering for what is righteous, you're suffering for the sake of Christ. So rejoice when you do righteous things, when you obey Christ, and difficulty comes as a result of that. Because it's only proof that you're really following Christ. In your struggle... Verse 4, Hebrews 12, in your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. You can see here that Jesus not only loves Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, but he loves the disciples who are going with him to Bethany. Because he's taking them with him in order that they may believe. That they may see the work of Christ and believe. So, will we be like Thomas? Let us go that we may die with him. Will we at least go? Will we at least go and see? We go and taste and see that the Lord is good. I hope you're made ready for next Sunday then. Let's stop there. Let me pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for awakening our expectation and appetite for next Sunday. Thank you also, O Lord, for showing us the glory of the Son of God or preparing us to show us the glory of the Son of God. Lord, and also thank you for showing us that our call to faith is not a comfortable call. It was never meant to be comfortable. But, O oh Lord, thank you that through the hardship and the adversity that you call us to through your word, if we may endure for the sake of Christ and for the name of Christ, that we may receive the blessings. As we humble ourselves, we thank you that we have the expectation that you will glorify us. O oh Lord, let us not seek ways which to, in which to glorify ourselves or to exalt ourselves or to make ourselves high, but to look for every opportunity where we may Humble ourselves before you. Thank you for your grace and favor toward us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing our.